Christian worship, an essential part, is that of making an offering. Tonight we have the privilege of sharing in a tangible way this, the success of this preaching mission. And we're going to ask at this time that our ushers will come and we're going to receive the offering. We have been struck a little heavy with uh, cold and snowy weather. Our attendance has been not quite up to par, so this means that you will need to give a little more heavily than uh, perhaps you have been in other times. Here's an announcement that every football fan will be interested in. Tomorrow night, we're going to be privileged to hear a Christian testimony from Bill Glass. We've had Mr. Wade, and he's here tonight. Tomorrow night, we're going to have Bill Glass of the Cleveland Browns with us to give a testimony in addition to the other fine speakers on the program. In addition to the message that we have received from Dr. Gabhart. We're delighted tonight to receive a message from one who has been in our preaching mission. We remember with deep appreciation, Dr. Ernest T. Campbell, pastor of the First Presbyterian Church in, in Ann Arbor, Michigan. After the Virginia Intermont Choir has given to us Another uh, message in music, we will hear Dr. Campbell.
I think you should know that Dr. Gabhart and I have been laboring under unusual stress this evening because of a bit of news that we heard upon our arrival in your community. First item of news that I learned was that on Monday night, one layman did what it takes two preachers to do the rest of the week. Now, there is a wave of anti-clericalism in the land, but you know, when one layman equals two ministers, this is time for us to unionize just a bit and see what we can do to protect ourselves. You see, we ministers have been extolling the laymen so long and saying so many fine things about them that laymen are actually beginning to believe them. So perhaps we'll have to find some other texts and do some other preaching. I'm grateful for what I've heard about that night and for the job that Bill Wade has done in this mission. And I think he's the one layman that I would let equal two or three or even four ministers on a given night. I come to you under a heavy sense of privilege. I say this sincerely and not routinely. So many have labored to produce this night, and one comes in from the outside and seems to thrive on the sense of expectancy that has been built up and the hours of preparation that have gone in to an undertaking of this kind. I thank whatever powers may be responsible for this mission that I have been accorded some part in it. Why aren't all the best chaps Christians? Why aren't all the best chaps Christians? If you suspect that this question has an aura of tea and crumpets about it, you're quite correct for it first fell from the pen of that noted British poet and preacher, G. A. Studdard Kennedy. But the problem behind the question belongs to each of us, and we've all brushed up against it at one time or another, whatever words we might have used to express it. Why aren't all the best chaps Christians? If the claims of the Christian gospel be true, why then is it not also true that invariably the best chaps we meet be Christians? Or to come at it down another runway, why aren't Christians invariably the best chaps we ever meet? Now this rather thorny question would not have arisen in the first place were it not for two very basic fundamental biblical propositions. The first is the claim of the Christian gospel to be God's ultimate word to men. Despite the current interest in comparative religion, despite the present emphasis on tolerance in our pluralistic society, we must face the fact that the gospel claims to be God's ultimate word to men. Jesus is not presented to us in Scripture as one way among many, as one truth among a large assortment of truths, as one life amid an array of other possible lives. He is commended rather as the way, the truth, and the life. The cross is not presented as one place of forgiveness among many. It is heralded in Scripture as the place from whence our healing comes. Easter Sunday is not one day among others that assures us of the life beyond. The resurrection of Jesus Christ is the basic fact on which we nourish the soul's invincible surmise. The name of Jesus is the name that stands alone. Neither is there salvation in any other. What God did in Christ is love's last word. Christ is the Lord of all and the Savior of any. This is not our claim, but his. We do not say that we have found the truth, but rather that the truth has found us and wills to find all men everywhere.
The other proposition that gives rise to the question of the hour stems from the outsider's insistence that this claim of the gospel to be God's ultimate word to man be demonstrated by the kind of life it produces in those who believe it. This is fair enough, is it not? Christianity is not to be measured by the cathedrals it has reared, by the doctrines it has formulated, by the art it has inspired, by the music it has written. Is not the gospel to be measured in terms of the impact that it makes on the life of those who believe in it? The veracity of our faith is not to be demonstrated in theological debate. It is not to be found in scholarly argument back and forth in the various reviews and quarterlies that flood the land. The authenticity of what we believe, says the outsider, must be demonstrated by a superior quality of life. And I suppose it reduces to this. If what you claim to be true is true, then you ought to be able to produce lives that surpass all other lives once this gospel is believed. And conversely, where this gospel has not been preached and has not been received, one should not expect to find this kind of excellency. Now, wouldn't it be fine if things worked out this way? This is that very clean demarcation that all of us at some time or other wish were true. It would make the preacher's job so much easier and the church school teacher's job and the theologian's job and all of those who regard themselves as defense attorneys for the gospel. If we could just have all the good guys on one side with the gospel and all the bad guys on the other side without the gospel, wouldn't this be helpful? But it isn't this way. Matthew Arnold one time said, show me 10 square miles outside of Christianity where the life of man or the virtue of woman is safe and I'll throw over Christianity at once. I doubt that Matthew Arnold would be able to make that statement if we were alive in our world today. The lines are just not that clean. The best chaps we know are not invariably Christians. And Christians are not invariably the best chaps in Ann Arbor or Johnson City or any other town that you might name. Now, what can we say to these things? Well, we can say, first of all, that we ought not as Christians to be unduly vexed that one can find excellence in the world outside. In those decades and centuries before Christ, there was virtue and there was excellence. Likewise today in the lives of so many who have no time for God, much less for his son, we ought not to be surprised that there are instances beyond enumeration of sublime ethical and moral achievement. When our fathers in the faith used to speak of total depravity, they didn't mean that everybody who had failed to say yes to God was as bad as he could possibly be. They simply meant that every area of man's life his intellect, his will, and his emotions had been infected and affected by his sin. John says of Jesus, that was the true light that lighteth every man that cometh into the world. In him was life, and the life was the light of men, so that the soul has yet to be born that is totally void of the witness of Jesus Christ within. The Bible nowhere teaches 
that natural man cannot be good. But it everywhere teaches that man by himself cannot be good enough. And then we might go on to wrestle through this question by observing together that much of Christianity through the years has spilled over into the world outside. This is one reason why this line cannot be so cleanly drawn. There are in our society today thousands of people whom we might describe as atmospheric Christians. People who have been affected by the gospel without being committed to the gospel. People who here and there can demonstrate some of the various facets of the Christian style of life. Pagans who still have lingering resemblances to the faith from which they departed, having learned it at their mother's knees. And John Bailey is so right when he says that an atheist may continue for a time to manifest the fruit of Christian love. After all, says Bailey, a driver, the railway engine does not stop as soon as the driver shuts off the steam, nor does a turnip wither and die as soon as it is pulled out of Mother Earth. But along with these two reasons, we might add this third one, that really none of us is in a position at any time to know who the best chaps really are. We just don't have the information on which to make this kind of a judgment. The only time I know for sure who the best man is is at a wedding. And this is by a token form of etiquette license. Oh, we know who the conventionally upright are. This is easy. We can draw up for ourselves a series of codes and ordinances and stand any life against it and make a very quick deduction. We can marshal along lists of do's and don'ts, mostly don'ts, and judge people against this background and click off a very quick and quite probably very inaccurate answer. Isn't it damaging, if not fatal, to this point of view that Jesus did not suggest that this is the way the gospel is to be understood? that you can tell who the best chaps are by their abstentions, their prohibitions, and their denials. I often hear people commending someone else by saying, this is a fine person. He doesn't drink, he doesn't smoke, he doesn't dip, he doesn't chew, he doesn't go to the movies. And when the recital of virtue is over, I try in my mind, at least, if not outwardly, to say, fine, but now go on and tell me, what does he do? It's embarrassing for us that Jesus kept the emphasis on the interior posture of the soul. The Pharisees were the ones who had been enabled to measure themselves favorably by an external code, but Jesus suggested that regarding the kingdom, they were on the outside looking in. Jesus talked about lust that lurks in the heart, about prejudice that pronounces on another person without having even seen that person the surly disposition, the will to dominate. 
And surely all of us are wise enough in the ways of life to know that it's quite possible to be virtuous and vicious at the same time. There's so much about people that we do not know. Aren't you glad that man looketh on the outward appearance and God looketh on the heart, or, or are you glad? Some people get off to a better start. Did you ever think of this? Some are born with a better physique, with a more favorable metabolism, with a nobler physical and mental heritage. Some are born with a sunnier disposition in their bones. We do not know what kind of struggle people enter into when we find them at any given point along the way. For some of us, coming here tonight was a matter of very simple routine. But I'm sure that there must be at least two or three or maybe more of us for whom coming here was a major decision because of the way our life has been twisted by circumstance and providence so that we cannot tell by any one single act just where the most virtuous and godlike person may be. We don't know how far this person whom we feel is not such a good chap has come on this road, do we? I can imagine the Apostle Peter a few years after the resurrection, going over to Ephesus to help the Apostle Paul put up a few tents. And it isn't hard for me to imagine that this big, blustery fisherman, who hadn't been used to this kind of work, struck at one of the pegs and missed and hit his nail instead and suddenly turned the air blue with a crisp oath. And unfortunately for him, one of the dear sisters from the church of Ephesus passed by and was heard to say that she was surprised that one who was in the church and indeed a rock of the church could say such a thing. But what that dear sister would not have known is that 15 or 20 years earlier, this man would have indulged in vituperative swearing against heaven for a five-minute stretch at a similar provocation. And this is what Robert Burns was trying to say when he said, what's done we partly may compute and yet not know what's resisted. Some people have a higher exposure quotient to temptation than other people. The traveling salesman perhaps is more afflicted at this point than the maiden school teacher. So I come back to the point that none of us is in a position at a given time to know precisely who the best chaps really are. And should we not also keep it very much in mind that Jesus did not choose people, nor does he choose people today, with an eye towards making his record look good? I believe very firmly in the position long held by American Presbyterians regarding alcohol, the position of voluntary abstinence. And because I believe and practice this principle, I get all kinds of mail from insurance companies who tell me that they like me, that they can save me money, because, believe it or not, I am a preferred risk. Now, Jesus didn't look around for preferred risks. 
He was prone to move towards people that others did not want. People like Mary of Magdala, Zacchaeus of Jericho and Judas Iscariot, people who had reputations as tarnished as unpolished brass. But there's one last word that I should like to share with you, and the rest really is preamble to all of this. And when we say this, we come awfully close to one of the major nerve centers of Old Testament and New Testament religion. That God is not primarily concerned with whether we are good, but whether we are His. Primarily concerned not with whether we are good, but whether we are His. Not that moral and ethical distinctions do not matter, but that they do not matter first or most. It grieves me that the gospel has degenerated in this country into a moralistic religion by which we forfeit those matchless accents on the grace and love of God. It grieves me when the Ten Commandments are presented as though if we obeyed these, God might like us. Will you bear in mind that the Ten Commandments were given to the people after they had been redeemed from Egypt? They were not given with an eye towards making the people gods if they would obey. They were already gods and they were to obey because they loved him. It is the relationship that comes before the record. And the difference between moralism and the gospel is the difference between Sinai and Calvary. As I understand this book, God is Father, and He wants us reunited to Him as members of a family are united to a head. He's not a quality control engineer in some factory. And when you get right down to it, these distinctions between good and better and best have no place in a family, have they? We talk this way about cheese or about hats or about cars. Did you ever see a mother say, this is my second best child? This is my third best? This is my finest? Like as a father pitieth his children, so the Lord pitieth them that fear him. A woman who had seven children was asked, by an audacious neighbor one day, which one of the seven do you love best of all? And she replied, I love the one who's lost until he's found. I love the one who's sick until he's well. I love the one who's down until he's up. I love the one who's sad until he's gay. This is family talk, and this is gospel talk. And our primary concern tonight should be not with the question whether I am good, but whether I am God's. And this is why some of the best chaps aren't Christian, because they won't surrender their will to God and acknowledge His claim of love upon their life and come home where they belong. It is conceivable that our eternal destiny hinges on an apostrophe, whether we choose to be gods, G-O-D-S, 
or whether we're willing to be gods. G-O-D apostrophe S. Let us pray. Eternal God, our Father, we bless thee for thy long-suffering ways toward us. As we stand on the threshold of this Lenten season, our sins are many before us, and yet thy grace is greater than our sin. Break down our pride, we pray thee. Deliver us from that self-righteousness which betrays our faith and drives Christ back upon his cross. Help us to accept thy pardon, to rejoice in thy love, and to live before men as those who have been found by thee. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, and for his sake. Amen. You know, I was just thinking that one of the grave dangers of the preaching mission and services like this, as indeed in the regular services in our churches, is that we shall hear and hear and hear and then do nothing about it that we shall be hearers of the word and not doers. Will you take that little card that was distributed a moment ago? Every one of you now. This is not just for the sinner or someone who's going to join the church. Let's all take the card. Now, the points that are listed on your decision card may not apply at all to you. They are just suggestive. Look over those suggestions that are on the decision card, and if there's a place for you to check for your particular decision, make it tonight. But for the most of us, maybe, those points are not to be checked. We've already checked them. But turn your card over now on the back side. And write on your card, if you have a pencil or a pen, write something, every one of you. We don't want these cards to go back blank. Write what you have learned and what you want to do in the light of these messages tonight. The Word of God is like a seed, something that is living, but it is of no value unless it's planted in a human heart and life. Write something on your card and write your name and what you intend to do. And then we're going to ask the ushers to come, collect the cards, and then they're coming here for a closing prayer. Ushers, give them time to write now before you pass those, those cups. Hold up now just a moment. Write something seriously and bow your head while you write it. Will you do that?
dedication of these commitments will also be our closing prayer. Will you come, Dr. Campbell, and pray again? Lead us in this closing prayer. We bless thee, O Lord, that thou art busy with every man, and that thy spirit never rests in his earnestness to move us from where we are to where we ought to be. Confirm, we pray thee, every good intention that has been vowed here this night in thy presence. Firm up our wills that we may do that which thou hast shown us needs be done. Restore unto us the joy of thy salvation and lead us in the way that we should go. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Oh, great God.